right, good evening, everyone. Good evening, church family here and abroad and wherever you wonder where Jonathan is. Uh, Jeremy drove him down to the airport, over to the airport, and he's on his way to South Carolina. So um, it's strange because, you know, his wife has that southern accent, but she doesn't fit in. They think she talks strange down in South Carolina. She has a deep south ac accent. Well, our song tonight, if you stand, please, is... Uh, Peace like a river, I think most of you know it. If you have peace, love, and joy, you're doing okay. But the caveat is it's got to be in the Lord. So let's sing that song, Peace Like a River. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. i got peace like a river in my soul. some in we'll do them next time okay you may be seated oh okay let's pray you can sit down and lord we just thank you for your um the fact that we can have love joy and peace in our hearts with you and uh in the midst of uh, circumstances that are going on in our world we can still find joy we can still find that we can love people help us to do that more effectively uh be with the uh people tonight uh, Lord, we pray for uh, peace in the people's hearts, not so, so much world peace, but the peace that uh, passes all understanding and that they would come to know you as their Savior. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. I want to welcome those who are watching online. I know that uh, you're there and tuning in, so make sure that you uh, uh, put a comment, uh, or put a like or something just so we know you're alive and well and you're out there tonight, okay? All righty, well, we got a good service tonight. It's going to be kind of a, a double header. Uh, we have, uh, I'll be doing the first part of the service, giving the Bible study. And uh, the second part of the service, we're going to turn over to one of our missionaries. Uh, unfortunately, uh, those online will not see our missionaries presentation. He's in a, a country that um, there could be potential uh, uh, problems and possibly him maybe having to leave the country, uh, you know, with the, um, uh, you know, with the exposure. So we're just kind of um, uh, keeping that under wraps. Those are in the service tonight. You'll get to meet him. We'll announce uh, him a little bit later on. But anyhow, we're glad uh, to be here tonight. We're going to look at, of course, the life of David. I do want to remind you of a few things here tonight, this Sunday. We are going to have a service that is around our ministry, the ministry fair. And what this is, is uh, we are uh, just showing you all the various ministries that the church are involved in. We're going to honor those who have been involved in ministry. And we are going to encourage others maybe to get involved in a ministry that, you know, they have not been a part of before, so that's going to be Sunday. Now we're going to have a, a lunch after uh, after the morning service. Now when I say lunch, it's going to kind of be like pizza, salad, that sort of stuff. Nothing special like last week, just uh, a, a quick bite to eat. And um, we, we want you to have opportunity to, to talk to some of the people at the ministry fair, give you an opportunity to uh, sign up. And if you <coughs> already had signed up, <coughs> excuse me, for our ministry fair, one of the ministries, we did this back in August. You don't have to, of course, sign up again, but we still want you to come, stay, 
And if you have any questions, we would uh, certainly be glad to talk to you about these things. Okay, so that is uh, this coming Sunday. And uh, a few other announcements here. We have uh, uh, the Fall Festival for our school in uh, a couple weeks. It's on a Saturday, October 30th. It's going to be outside, so I invite everybody out for the Fall Festival. And uh, also, what else is happening? Um, yeah, there, for, there are teens now. We have a new teen pastor, uh, Brother Justin Dillplane. They are having a, a High Point camp. So if you have some kids that are teenagers, uh, have them contact uh, Pastor Justin. He'll give them information about that. Sunday school, we started back again several weeks ago, 10 o'clock for all ages. I want to invite you to come on out. You've been coming out at 11 o'clock, so come out an hour early. Join one of our Sunday school classes. All right, so those are some of the things that are happening. <clears throat> in our church. All right, we're going to go to 2 Samuel tonight, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Thank you, Alan, for filling in for John as he is on his way down south. He'll be gone for a few days. He'll be back for Sunday. 2 Samuel chapter number 7. And uh, we are going to uh, look tonight <clears throat> at a title. What title did I give that? Let's put that up. A house for God. All right, I didn't have it on my paper here. All right, a house for God. We're going to talk about a house for God. And uh, we're going to start off in 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting in verse 1. And it came to pass uh, when the king sat in the house, his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. Let's pray for the Bible study. Lord, thank you tonight for the time to study the word. Bless it, use it, help us to understand now another aspect of David's life in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you were with us last week, you remember we were looking at David uh, desiring to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to, um, uh, back to, to Jerusalem uh, he conquered the city of Jerusalem from the Jebusites, and now that became his home there. And, uh, you know, he um, wanted to bring back this, this symbol of God's presence, the Ark of the Covenant. Well, how did that go when he brought it back? Was there a little bit of a problem? Yeah, there was a big problem. How many remember what happened last week? They put it on a cart, an ox cart, and as they're, you know, transporting it, the, um, of course, the, the two sons of the fella in which the Ark of the Covenant was staying at his house for a number of years is now going with the procession of people all out there and playing instruments, and it's kind of like a big parade. And uh, as the Ark of the Covenant begins to shake a little bit, one of the guys that was helping the transportation, a man by the name of Uzzah, reached out to steady the Ark, and when he did, he was struck down dead because he touched the Ark of the Covenant. You can't touch the Ark of the Covenant. Now, there are a couple problems we mentioned from last week about this. Uh, one of the problems was that David did not follow the Old Testament law concerning how to transport the Ark. Only the priests could transport the Ark, and they could only do it if they put poles or staves through each side of the Ark and carried it. That was the way in which God designed it to be carried. But um, they violated some laws there. Now, David was displeased, displeased with himself, displeased that this had happened, kind of messed up the parade. And uh, so they, they kind of put the ark on hold for several months. And there it went to the house of uh, Obed-Edom. And um, for three months, uh, God blessed that household for housing the ark. Well, three months comes and goes. And now David's going to attempt again to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And so this time he does it right. And uh, they bring it back and David is so excited and he's dancing, he's jumping up and down. And all he has on is his, uh, the priestly garment called the ephod. It was just a, uh, a, a uh, kind of a, you know, just a, a, a small type of robe or, or a, a, you know, something that would just cover just part of his body. And uh, so as he was dancing and, you know, excited about bringing back the Ark of the Covenant, his wife, one of his many wives, remember he had a lot of wives at that time? His very first wife, and she was the daughter of whom? King Saul. Her name was Michael. 
She sees David coming back dancing, and she despises him. She calls him out when he gets home. Why did you jump around like that and act like that? And you weren't dressed appropriately. And so, uh, you know, gave a hard time to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to him for that, for doing that. Alrighty, so, you know, these are some of the things that uh, he had to go through. Alrighty, now, as we look at uh, tonight's lesson, and by the way, what happened to Michael? What was her judgment? She would be barren the rest of her life. She would have no children, and that was God's punishment against her. Okay, so let's pick up the story. Now, you have the ark. Where did David put the ark when it came back to Jerusalem? In a, in a, in a tabernacle, in a tent. Now, it wasn't the original tabernacle that they'd used 400. Now, you have to realize, 400 years, you know, uh, back uh, when the ark was, was, was first brought in. And uh, now it is um, uh, there. Uh, you, if you remember from, from um, in the days of Moses is when the ark was built while they were in the wilderness. So they spent 40 years in the wilderness. Then they moved to Israel. And if you remember, there were... 325 years of the judges period. Remember, we went through all the judges. And then the first king was Saul. So it, it went through all these time periods, not having a place, not being in a temple, housed temporarily in a tabernacle. And so David now has a desire. He has just built himself a house. He's been a king now for about... 15 years. How many years would David rule over Israel, the entire nation? <clears throat> well, 40 total. First seven and a half years, just the one tribe. What tribe was that? Judah. The last 33 and a half years over all of Israel. All right, so um, this is kind of where we are tonight. Now, David comes and um, he had finally gotten rest from all of his enemies and he comes to the prophet Nathan. Now, Nathan is going to be part of another story of, of David's life. But it was his, his prophet, his man of God, which showed you that even though David was a man of God, God didn't always speak to David directly. Sometimes he would speak through the prophet. The prophet's office was to receive the word from God and then give it out. So Nathan is the prophet, and he goes to him, and he says, I think he feels guilty. He says, I dwell in a house of cedar. I have a nice place to live, but there's no house for God. Why don't we build a house for God? So the first point we're going to look at tonight is this. David desires to build the temple. David desires to build the temple. Now realize a temple would be a permanent structure. The tabernacle was built to be a temporary dwelling place. And when the tabernacle was built, it could be disassembled and carried by the priests from place to place. Because when they were wandering in the wilderness, they didn't stay in one place. They traveled all different areas. So uh, now David has his city. David has his house. And now he wants a house for God. He wants to build God a temple where the Ark of the Covenant could be and they could dwell there. Uh, or he could, there, there could be the presence of God there. All right, so uh, let's see. The first thing that David does is uh, he speaks to Nathan. He speaks to Nathan. And we saw that in verses 1 through 3, and he comes to, uh, to Nathan telling him that he wants to, to build an ark. I'm sorry, uh, to build a temple for the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, so Nathan says, go do what is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. Now, so God now is going to speak to Nathan and give Nathan the message to give back to King David. Let's see what God tells Nathan. Verse number four, And it came to pass that, that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house uh, for me to dwell in, whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent." And in a, in a tabernacle, and in all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people, Israel, saying, Why build ye not a house of cedar? Now, it's interesting the response that God gives 
to Nathan to give to David. In essence, what God said is, did I ever command a temple to be built? It's been 400 some years. When he went under Joshua into the promised land, did he tell Joshua to build a temple? No. During that 300 and some years in which the judges ruled, did he tell any of those people to build a temple? No. Did he tell King Saul, the first king, to build a temple? No. Did he tell David to build a temple? No. So whose idea was it to build a temple? David. It was David's idea. God never said, David, you're going to build a temple. Now, that doesn't mean it wasn't God's will, but it shows you that David initiated the whole subject of building a temple. And so he brings it before God, and God now, in essence, says that um, he, uh, he, he never said that he needed to build a temple. Uh, is there a temple now in Jerusalem? No. It was destroyed a long time ago, 70 A.D. So for over, uh, you know, over 1,900 years, 1,900, you know, 50 years, I guess, there has not been a temple. But where is the temple? Is not your body the temple of the Holy Spirit? Um, in fact, when Jesus came to, to the earth in John 1, 14, the Bible says, and the word uh, became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt means he tabernacled amongst us. So uh, he reminded David of his grace now, as he said uh, in verse number 8. Now therefore, so shall uh, thus... Or, now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from the following the sheep to be ruler over my people of Israel, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies, and of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, and like unto the name of great men that are in the earth. Now he's, God's recounting the whole calling of David. I called you when you were a shepherd. Do you remember that call we talked about many weeks ago when Samuel the prophet went to the house of Jesse and asked to have his sons come out? How many sons first came out? Seven sons. Seven sons came out. Were any of those sons the chosen one? No, the eighth son, the youngest of them all, he was a little shepherd guy, not even there. But that's the one that God called to be the king. And from a, a meager uh, shepherd boy that he was, God said, I've turned you into a great man of God. I've turned you into a great king. And everybody knows who David is around the world. And so now he's shown how that uh, he has elevated David. And so verse number 10, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more, neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them uh, any more as before time. So God now is telling him, uh, here's where you came from. I I'm going to take care of things. And notice the promise next that he gives. Notice God's promise to David. Verse number 11. He says this, And since the time that I commanded thee to be over... Uh, my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies. Also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So would David have an opportunity to build the temple? No, but he said, from your seed, the next generation will build a temple. So the promise to David is that the temple will get built. It just won't be under your ministry. It won't be while you're alive. And uh, so he uh, proclaimed that I will not only establish a temple through him, I will establish a kingdom. Now, what, what God is now introducing is a covenant. A covenant means agreement between two people. God is now going to make a covenant with David, an agreement. And in this agreement, what he's telling David is this. Not only am I going to give you a place for me to dwell, 
but I'm going to establish your kingdom uh, for, forever, in essence. Now, what is he talking about? Well, who was the first king? King Saul. And what tribe was he from? Benjamin. And David was from Judah. So, what we know then is that when God disqualified King Saul, he not only disqualified him, but he disqualified his tribe and all his descendants from ever being in the king. Now, in essence, what he's saying to David is, I will never disqualify your, your family. Your family will always have a royal position uh, from generation to generation, and you will be established, thy kingdom, and it will be established forever. So let's think about this. Is there a kingdom now in which a ruler from David is the king over modern-day Israel? No. Has there been a king for many years from the rule of David? Do you know who the last king of Israel was? It was a man by the name of Zedekiah. And Zedekiah was taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And the kings of Israel ended with Zedekiah. Now, and that was around 586 B.C. So from 586 B.C. to now, there's never been a king from the lineage of David that has ruled in Israel. But if you think about this, God uh, promised that there would come one that would be through the lineage of David. Let's turn back, uh, turn ahead, if you would, to Luke chapter 1, verse 31. Luke 1, 31, if you would, please. Jesus is born. What is the significance of the birth of Christ? Well, there's a lot of significance. Of course, he came to die on a cross to be our Savior. But notice the prophecy concerning Jesus in Luke chapter 1, verse 31. And this is when the angel Lord came to Mary to announce that she would bring forth the Christ child. Verse 31, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, or Savior. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Did you see that? Jesus would come and he would be the final king in the lineage for David. And notice it says in verse 33, And he, Jesus, shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. When Jesus was born, the prophecy, in essence, was that this is the last king of Israel. When Jesus was put up on trumped-up charges before Pontius Pilate, how did the Jewish religious leaders try to get Pontius Pilate to crucify Jesus? What angle did they use? They, in essence, said that he said he's the king of the Jews. That was the only way they could possibly get the Roman government to execute Jesus. Now, was... When he was interviewed, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom was to come. Have you ever prayed the Lord's Prayer? Thy kingdom come. Has the kingdom of God come yet? Doesn't look like it. When does the kingdom of God come? When Jesus returns. After the seven-year tribulation, Jesus returns. He defeats the Antichrist in the battle of the Armageddon. He sets up his kingdom for a thousand years, the millennial reign of Jesus. He rules and reigns for a thousand years from the city of David, from Jerusalem. And then new heaven and new earth come down as this earth will be melted by a great fervent heat. And King Jesus rules out of the new Jerusalem forever and ever and ever. So when, when God spoke to Nathan that day, he not only had a promise that he would have a, build a house, but a long-lasting promise that he would have an eternal kingdom that would come through the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, well, why did God turn down the request 
of David. Didn't that seem like a, an honorable request? I want to be the one that heads up the temple. I want to build a place for the Ark of the Covenant. I want a place to worship. Well, we have to turn to 1 Chronicles. If you jump ahead to that. Um, in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, it gives us the answer to that question. 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse number 8. In 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 8, it says this. <clears throat> the word, but the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thou shalt, thou hast shed blood abundantly, and hast made great war. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in thy sight. Behold, a son shall be born of thee, who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about him. For this name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness. Into the, uh, unto Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. So why was David refused uh, to build? Because God said, you've shed a lot of blood. You've been in and out of battles. You're in war a lot. And we're going to wait for peace times. We're going to wait till your son comes. Everything will be over by then. You'll have conquered all your enemies. And let him be the one that will set up, the king, set up this, the Ark of the Covenant. Well, I love David's response because, you know, David could have gotten upset. He could have said, hey, I, I'm the one, it's my idea. Listen, could, could we still do this? And he accepted God's will. And that's the third thing that I want you to look at under this point is David accepts God's will with praise. With praise. Verse number 18. Um, then went King David in and sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, Lord, O Lord God? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? Uh, from this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God, but thou hast spoken also thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of, uh, the manner of man, O Lord God? And um, so David goes on, and in essence, what he's saying in verse 18 through 21 He's shown his humility. He's showing that he, he, he accepts God's will. Have you ever had a plan that was a good plan, but maybe it just wasn't God's will? Have you ever had an idea that you thought really was God's plan, but then it never came to pass? You know, you have two responses. Either you get frustrated or you, you just accept God's will. You know, many times our will and God's will don't coincide. What we went out of life, sometimes not the same thing God wants out of life. And we're not saying what David desired, it was a good thing, was it not? It wasn't a bad thing to, to, to build a temple. It was a good thing, but it wasn't the right time. And that's another thing about God's timing. Sometimes we pray for things and want things, but it's just not the right time. God has a better plan, a better time, a better purpose, according to God's will. Do you remember the story of Mary and Martha, whose brother Lazarus had died? When Lazarus was ready to die, they sent word to Jesus. He was on the other side of the Jordan River. And they said, come quickly, our brother Lazarus is dying. Well, by the time the messenger got there, Lazarus had already died. Now, Jesus knew that. The disciples didn't know that. And if you remember, he waited a few days. And by the time he came to the home, the home of Lazarus, they were having a funeral for Lazarus. Mary and Martha both came out, Martha first and Mary second, and they both said the same thing. If thou only would have been here sooner, our brother would not have perished. But wait a minute. Was it God's will that Lazarus died? Was it God's will that Jesus came four days late? Was it God's plan that he would not show a healing, but he would show a resurrection, even a greater miracle? Because it was Jesus' way of saying to the people, what you see is happening to Lazarus is going to happen to me. For I am the resurrection and the life. Now, God's plan superseded Mary and Martha's plan. Their plan, hurry, come, heal our brother. And when it didn't work out, they're kind of, Letting Jesus know about it. If only you'd have been here earlier. Don't rush the plan of God. Don't think that your plan is better. Don't think your timing is better. Don't think that, you know, you know better than God. 
God knows what is best. Therefore, when you pray and you don't receive the answer that you want, like David didn't receive the answer he wanted, the answer David wanted <coughs> was, yes, i let you build a temple, but that wasn't the answer. The answer was, yes, you'll get a temple, but you won't build it. Sometimes God's no's are not permanent no's, but they're just temporary no's. Sometimes God, uh, as we pray and we don't get the answers, rather than get frustrated and mad and upset with God, why don't you just pray like Jesus did, not my will, but thine be done. Is that a sign of maturity for Christians when they can accept the will of God? I'm sure if I took a poll of everybody that's here in the room and all those who are watching online, and I said, how many times did you pray for something and God didn't give it to you because he gave you something better later on? Or he, he, uh, he, uh, he gave it to you, but it wasn't the right time. So what do we do? We keep praying. We seek the Lord when he doesn't answer. When he shows us differently, we accept his will, and we do it with praise. So David is humble. He said, I know I'm nobody special. I was just a little kid when you, you, you took me in. And, uh, and so with great humility, he accepts the will of God. And uh, he uh, then begins to praise the Lord. Verse 22, he says, uh, Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what one nation in the earth is like to thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself, and to make him a name, and to do for you great things and terrible for thy hand. Behold, thy people which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations, and from their gods, and and he goes on and he's just praising the Lord and just thanking God for his providence and his protection. Notice then the last uh, two couple of verses, verse 28 and 29. And now, O Lord God, thou uh, art that God, and thy words be true, and thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Therefore now, let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord, God, hast spoken it. And with thy blessing, let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. Now, would David have any part in the building of the temple? Yes, and we're going to look at this at, at the end of his life. But at, just kind of jump ahead a little bit. At the end of David's life, one of the last things that David did was he commissioned the uh, the, the builders and the supplies and the money to be raised for the building of the temple. And when Solomon became king, Solomon had his, at his disposal the materials, the workers, the money, the resources to build the temple. David, in essence, had turned over to his son everything he needed to do to build the temple for God. So David, in essence, had some hand in the building of the temple. It just wasn't going to happen uh, during his lifetime. And so um, we see David accept God's will, and he prays the Lord for that. All right, now we go to chapter 8. We're going to kind of skip over chapter 8 a little bit. I'm just going to give you just a, a brief point about chapter 8. The second point we're going to look at tonight is how that uh, David extends his kingdom. Do you remember there are all of these enemies in the land? Now, you, we read a lot about the Philistines, but there were a bunch of other enemies that were in the land. And so David now, in order to establish his kingdom, has to go through and defeat nation after nation after nation, like Joshua did initially when Joshua went into, into Israel. But because they did not finish the job initially, all these nations came back, repopulated, became strong again, became a thorn in the side of Israel. So David now um, goes and he leads battles and he defeats all his enemies. Notice all the enemies that David had to defeat. David had to defeat in, in chapter um, 8, verse 1. He smote the Philistines. And uh, verse 2, he smote Moab. And verse 3, he smote uh, the uh, Hazardir, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. Uh, and then verse 5, and when the Syrians came, he defeated the Syrians. And uh, he goes down, and then Ammon was defeated. Then the Amalekites were defeated. And all the people groups were defeated uh, by 
David. So now he has established his kingdom. That's why God said, you don't have time to build a temple. You're too busy clearing out all these other nations. And once you defeat all these other nations, now your son comes in. He doesn't have to fight any battles. He can concentrate on building a temple for the Lord. Sounds like God has the best plan all the time, doesn't he? We just have to trust God's plan and not our own. Now, the third point we're going to look at tonight, and this is our final point for the night. We're kind of giving you a, a shorter lesson tonight to give our missionary brother some time uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the end of this, this uh, part of the service. And uh, the, la the last point we want to look at tonight is how that David cares for Mephibosheth. David cares for Mephibosheth. David was hated by King Saul. Saul tried to kill David on many occasions. But there were several times when Saul came to his right mind, when David proved to him that he could have killed him. Remember, there were two times David could have killed Saul. He had him trapped in a cave. And both times David said, I will not raise my hand against God's anointed. Now because of that, um, Saul felt bad. And he says to David, I know you're going to be king someday. Just, you know, take care of my family. Now David's uh, promise and covenant to Saul was that when I become king, I will not wipe out your family. Jonathan, who was Saul's son, was a very devoted friend to David. And likewise, David made a covenant to Jonathan and said, when I become king... I will take care of your family. We will not seek revenge. Because sometimes in, uh, in, in biblical times, whenever a new regime took over, they would wipe out all the family members of the previous king so that there would never be any, re any revolt against them. So David now is going to come. And so first point under that, why is he, wh who's this Mephibosheth? He's going to fulfill a promise to Saul and Jonathan. So let's see what chapter 9 says. And David, verse number 1, said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I might show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I might show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. So Jonathan had a son. He had a boy. Now Jonathan's dead. Remember, he died with his dad in battle. His other brothers died likewise. And so now, uh, you, you remember his, his uh, um, uh, one of um, Saul's other sons was anointed king initially. Remember his name? Ish, Ishbosheth, right? Remember, he was murdered. And David then became king over all of Israel. Well, there's very few descendants of Saul left now. And they, David wants to know, can I, is there somebody that has been maybe overlooked or I can take care of? And he said that there is one young man, Saul's, uh, Jonathan's son, this would be Saul's grandson. He's lame on his feet. <coughs> and um, so he says, where is he? And he says he's in the house of Matcher. And the king sent for him, and he said, Get him out of Mechur, the son of Emil, from Lodibar. And when Mephibosheth, verse number 6, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come, he fell on his face and, and, uh, and, he, and, and he, he uh, did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servants. Behold thy servants. Now, we, uh, we see that now, there's an opportunity for David to do good. There's an opportunity for David to fulfill his promise to Saul and to Jonathan. And uh, so what does he do? Well, number one, he restores all his land. Verse number seven tells us that. And he says, uh, David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan's sake, for my father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And so he said, not only are you going to get all your land back, but I am going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. Now, uh, this boy had been lame on his feet uh, since a child. 
he, uh, he had been injured whenever uh, the, the message came about his father being, being killed in battle. And so David said, I'm going to take you and let you be part of, of my family now. And so um, the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, verse number nine, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul and to his house. Therefore, uh, uh, thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him and uh, make him in the fruits and, and master's son shall, uh, son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, my master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Isn't this a, a tender thing that he says? And uh, he says, take care of his family, but Mephibosheth gets to come to my house every night to eat dinner. What an honor it was to eat with the king. What an honor it was to sit down with the king of Israel every night. Here's a young man crippled as a child, lame on both of his feet. And now he is, can eat at the house of David every day. And so uh, he dwells in Jerusalem. He eats at David's house. And, uh, and so that's David's way of taking care of him. Now, verse 13, So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. As we kind of bring this little study to a conclusion, I want to leave you with one last thought. And that is what David's response to Mephibosheth is a beautiful picture of salvation. It's a picture of salvation. Think about this. Mephibosheth is lame. He cannot help himself. There's nothing he can do. He's lost his property. His, his, his father was, was killed in battle. His dad was a sinner. His, uh, I'm sorry, his grandfather, King Saul, his father was a good man. Jonathan was a good man. And David could have very easily disregarded his promise. But his promise was, I will take care of this descendant of yours. You know, we're kind of like Mephibosheth. We're sinners, helpless, hopeless. We have no power to save ourselves. Just like Mephibosheth, he had no power to take care of himself, no power to do anything. He's helpless. And David extends mercy and David extends grace. Isn't that what God did to each and every one of us? He extended grace and he extended mercy. And God says, I forgive you. And not only will you be my, uh, I will be your savior, but you get to be my child because what happened is Mephibosheth got taken into David's house like he was a child of David. And isn't that what our Heavenly Father does when he invites us to come and live with him forever? Isn't that what heaven is all about? Our Father says, hey, come live at my house and eat at my table every day. You know, when we get to heaven... People want to know what we're going to be doing, where we're at, and all this other stuff. But I think one thing, I think we'll be eating at the table of the Master for all eternity. And so what a beautiful picture of salvation now. And he provided every need for Mephibosheth, just like God provides every need for us. And so tonight we look at a couple little stories here, and I hope they were a blessing to you. As David now wants to build an ark, God says, no, it's all a matter of principle of timing, principle of accepting God's will. He would let his son do it. He took care of Mephibosheth, picture of grace, picture of salvation. So we see some wonderful applications uh, to these stories. We're going to pray at this time and ask the Lord to bless. Father, thank you now for this time to share the word. I pray it was a blessing to each and every one of us as we looked at uh, this uh, little Bible study tonight. Uh, help, hopefully, Lord, as we continue our study uh, in uh, the book of First and Second Samuel and, and uh, Chronicles, that we will understand now more about David and uh, all the different aspects of this great man of God. Thank you for this time we've spent together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, those who are watching online, we're going to say goodbye to you, and uh, we're going to sign off. And those who are in our service here tonight.